Go to 281. Oh, uh, send the last one. The first and last verse of this one together. Yeah.
Amen. Good to see everyone here this morning. Glad you're here in God's house. It's always good to be here. Sort of like, uh, sort of like my life, I had a little rocky start. Amen. But I'm hoping to finish strong. And that's what we did. That's what we did with our song service. Amen. Amen. It's okay. We're fallible. None of y'all perfect either. All right. <laughs> Go ahead and get that out and open. When we're honest about that, there's none of us perfect. It, it makes things easier, okay? Because they're none of us all. Alright? This morning, I want you to turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. Mark, chapter 1, 16 through 20. Mark 1, 16 through 20, reads like this. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had come a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who, who also were in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and went after Him. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You again for this day, for this opportunity to praise You and worship You, Father. And although we're, we're such imperfect, fallible beings, Lord, You've promised to make us perfect, covered and clothed in the righteousness of Your Son, Jesus Christ, by the power of Your Holy Spirit. For that this morning, we are most thankful, Father. Lord, we want to take a look at Your Word today. Show us how it can mold us and shape us to be more suitable vessels for Your service. Lord, once again, I pray that You give me every word to say and every thought to have, that You would anoint me and anoint this service this morning, Lord, so that we might hear a word from You, so that our hearts and minds will be open to what You have to tell us today, Lord. Thank You for all these things, my Heavenly Father. It's in Your name we pray. Amen. Folks, we can't afford to be just another church anymore. We can't afford to be just another Christian anymore. We live in a world where the devil has, is pulling at everybody in so many different directions. Think about your kids. You know people used to go to church on Sundays because they didn't have anything else to do. Let's be honest about it. A lot of people got in church, heard the gospel, and got saved because they were at church because they didn't have anything better to do. Now we've got three million channels on TV. We've got movie theaters with 32 theaters in it. We've got the internet. We've got Facebook. We've got all these things at our disposal to entertain us and draw our attention away from what our mission is. Now Jesus Christ here wasn't making a statement just about fishing using a, a neat little wordplay on I'll make you fishers of men. He was making a statement about who we are as His followers and what our mission is as the church. And folks, I believe as churches, even as individuals do today, I believe as churches we get sidetracked from the mission God has for us. I believe we get so busy sometimes that we forget what Jesus had us all come together here to do. We need to focus on our mission. That is who we are, why we are here, and what we ought to be about. Now as we grow and as any church grows, the danger is getting sidetracked off of the mission God gave us. Getting sidetracked off of our purpose for being here. That's the danger. We'll experience that. Any church that has grown has experienced that. The danger and the temptation to get sidetracked off our primary mission, and that is to do some deep soul fishing. Now that is a neat little play on words. I do say so myself. But Jesus Himself called His first disciples and He used the analogy of fishing. So we're going to use it for the next four weeks. You know, deep sea fishing, deep sea fishing 
is a $2.4 million industry. Last year, the economic impact of deep sea fishing was $4.5 billion and there are 55,000 jobs in the United States that are either directly or indirectly tied to deep sea fishing. Pretty neat, I thought. There's more to deep sea fishing than I thought. Now, I went deep sea fishing one time and, and I, was, I was very excited about going because I'd grown up fishing. I love fishing. I was just, it's so exciting going out there and in the water and the, the fish out there, finding the fish, figuring out what they'll bite. Hooking them, reeling them in, that's just so exciting to me. And I was looking so forward to going deep sea fishing. There was a church group going, so I figured, how much trouble can I get in? I'll go with them. Although they, they were from Ohatchee. They should have put me in. No, they were great guys. Great guys. They took me under their wing. Got to go deep sea fishing. It was a one-day trip because, as some of you know, if, if I've ridden with you driving, you know, I get motion sick very easy. I've gotten motion sick driving a vehicle with me being the driver. I get motion sick very easy. So I was really nervous about deep sea fishing. Obviously. I got so nervous I went and got these, these pills that, that keep you from getting motion sick, that keep you from getting seasick. And I took these pills, and, and people told me, well, you eat this. You know, you eat saltine crackers, and you, you drink, you know, clear soda. You do, they kept telling me all these things I need to do, and I need to, you need to stand in this part of the boat. You need, to, you need to stand here, and you need to do this. And every so often, you need to go down under the boat. You, you need to make sure you take that. And I had patches. It looked like I had the measles. I had those little patches all up. Keep me from getting seasick. Folks, by the time we got to where we were fishing, I was so worried about getting seasick, I almost forgot why I was on the boat. <laughs> we do that as Christians too. Remember when you first got saved? I hope you remember. Remember when you first got saved and you were so excited about Jesus Christ? going out and telling other people about Jesus Christ, you couldn't help but do it. You were so excited about it, you couldn't do anything but go tell people about Jesus. People would even ask you, hey, something's different about you, what is it? Opportunity after opportunity. I remember when we got to where we were fishing, the boat was still rocking a little bit, but I didn't throw up. I was good. Dropped my bait in the water. Started catching those fish. And we caught, if you've ever been to deep sea fish, we caught the trigger fish. We caught the red snappers. We caught, and, and I was so excited. We caught flounder, funny looking little critter, but good to eat. And I was so excited. We were catching fish one after another. I thought, this is great. This is why I'm here. Ever feel like that for Jesus Christ? You ever get to the point in your Christian life when you know not just that He saved you, but why He saved you? And you think, Oh Lord, thank you. This is why I'm here. This is why you made a me. We all have a purpose. God didn't make you and go, Oh, well now what am I going to do with them? It's not the way to happen. <coughs> God knew about you before He created the heavens and earth. He knew you. Not knew He would make you, He knew you. But once I got there and started catching those fish, I just, I thought, this is awesome. This is why I'm here. I forgot all about getting seasick. Didn't even enter my mind. But you know, that ocean was so big, I stopped at one point and I, I looked out and I, all I could see was water. I couldn't see land anywhere. In fact, I didn't even know how to get back to the land. Gene Shaw wasn't with me. You know, GPS is Gene Position System. He's better than the satellites. He's a navigator, but I'm not. So I'm out there in the ocean. I look, the sun's just, there it is. I, I, I didn't know. I couldn't have got back to the land if I needed to. 
And all of a sudden, that ocean seemed so big. <clears throat> and I looked out over that ocean and I thought, we're catching a few little fish right here by this boat. There's so many more fish in this ocean than we're even getting near. Isn't that wonderful? Do you see where this is going? We're in a boat. We're in a boat. I believe if Jesus was here, he, he wouldn't see a building. I think He'd see a boat. And He'd see one or two things. He'd either see fishermen or fish. I think He'd see fishermen or fish. Two kinds of people. There's fishermen and there's fish. And guess what? Every one of us is one of the two. You're going to see in a minute being a fish isn't quite so bad. We're either fishermen or fish. We're in a boat. So what do you think that makes our job as a church? It's to catch fish. It's to catch fish. Notice I didn't say to clean fish. On our deep sea fishing trip, when all those trigger fish and all those, all those good things to eat, we got them all back. You know what? The, the guys on the boat, the deckhands, they clean the fish. And I'd cleaned fish before. I had a fillet knife and I figured I could do it, you know. And we get back and I'm thinking, we're going to clean these fish. They said, no, 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 you don't clean. We'll get that. We'll do that. It's our job. Folks, it's not our job to clean fish. Amen? amen. I want to amen. It's not our job to clean fish. Amen. It's our job to catch fish. So let's talk about catching fish. What does that mean? Listen, to, listen again to what Jesus said in verse 17 there. He says, And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Folks, that verse right there is our primary purpose, our mission statement, if you will. You all know I have a bachelor's degree in business management. So when I was in college, there was, it was a big move toward you got to have a mission statement. You don't know where you're going if you don't have a mission statement. You don't know what your mission is. Any military man here, and there's some in the room, will tell you you have to have a mission. You have to know where you're going, what your objective is. Folks, that is our mission as a church. That's every church there is mission. It's a church of Jesus Christ. And that is to be fishers of men. That's our primary purpose. Now let's talk about what that means. There's three things here that, that just jump out at us. First, we are in the following business. Isn't it amazing that the first two words Jesus said to His disciples was, Follow me. Follow me. He didn't give them a big speech. He didn't give them a big spiel. He just said, Hey, you, follow me. He didn't say that. He just said, Hey, follow me. were thinking. I try to put myself in the position you know, of James and John and Simon and Andrew there. I try to put myself in their position. And, and I think, what would I, what would I do? What would I say? This guy comes walking up. I'm at work. I'm doing my job. And this guy says, follow me. Who me follow you. Who are you? I, I, I'm thinking, I would have been going, hey, wait, Jesus. Okay, I know I there's something about you. I feel like I need to follow you, but but wait, what, what job is this we're going to do? How much does it pay? Does it have a 401k? Who am I going to be working with? Am I going to have to move? If you've ever had a job, you want to know all those things. Do I get any vacation time? Will I be able to pay my bills? On what you're going to pay? Jesus, what, what I need to do with my boat my fishing business? See, these guys were in the fishing business. That was their job. They weren't fishing for fun. It wasn't Saturday on the Coosa River, guys. This was their living. And Jesus says, follow me. And immediately, they followed Him. It's pretty amazing. You know, there's... No pastorate, no missionary, no youth pastoring, no music ministry, 
Nothing else is greater or above this primary calling of Jesus Christ on the life of every believer, and that is to follow Him. That's it. That's the first thing. You want to know how to go to heaven? Follow Jesus. You want to know what Jesus wants you to do with your life? you got to follow Him first. And just like these guys, they didn't even ask, where are we going? Follow you where? <coughs> Reminds me of an old gravestone that had this epitaph on it. It said, Pause, my friend, as you go by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. Prepare, my friend, to follow me. And then somebody had come along under it and scratched this in, in underneath. It says, to follow you is not my intent until I know which way you went. <laughs> Jesus, where are we going, man? I'm, can you see I'm busy? I'll be off work at 6 o'clock, Jesus, and then I'll come follow you. I'm sad to say I've done those things in my life. I've done those things in my life. The Lord's told me to do this. I'm like, oh, Lord, I can't. Well, i got to get this done first. I can't just follow you. Hold on. Give me a minute. Let me think this out. Let me make sure this lines up with what I want to do. Of course, I don't want to be too uncomfortable. I don't want it to be too sacrificial. I want to follow you because I, I know you're the way to get to heaven. <coughs> but I'm not sure I want to follow you with what I've got going on today. I'll follow you tomorrow. But I notice something here in verse 18 that says, they immediately left their nets and followed Him. They immediately left their nets and followed Him. I picture not even tying the boat off, not even throwing the old bait out, not, not even cleaning the fish, just getting out of the boat and following Him. I think of all the times I had an opportunity just to follow Jesus. Not to ask questions, not to bargain with Him and reason with Him. Not to question Him, but just to follow Him. And I wouldn't even put down my fishing pole and do it. I wouldn't even quit what I had going on long enough to follow my, my Lord. And yet I call Him my Lord. If Jesus calls us to do something today, Will we just follow Him in obedience? That's a serious question. It's for every one of us. I'm not asking you to tell me out loud. Will I follow Him? First, we're in the following business. Second, we're in the finding business. We're in the finding business. Now, if following Jesus, what He says here is, I will make you fishers of men... If Jesus says our primary job is to fish for men for Him, then first thing, I've I got to know how to find the fish. Amen? I, I think many times that, that's, our, that's our... I say problem because I love you, but it's really probably our excuse. <clears throat> Unless you're a hermit out in the woods somewhere, you run into some people. And is your primary objective to find out if, if they're saved? To find out if they've been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ? Find out if they're on the way to heaven or on their way to hell? I hope it is. It should be. But if we're going to be in the following business, Jesus says you'll be in the fishing business. And if you're going to find fish, you've got to figure out how to find fish. You know, when I was a kid, uh, my, my first experience my dad was great, but... He really kind of did me wrong on this. I'll tell you why. <laughs> yeah, poor old daddy. You know, he, he's probably thinking, I, I need to find me another church. <laughs> At least you know I'm not lying about any stories because you can ask him right after church. Is that true? <laughs> when I was a kid, my granddad had a, a really nice lot on the lake up in... Uh, was Cedar Bluff. He had a really nice place on Weiss Lake up there. And he had this, this boat dock that went out into the water there and he had a big street lamp that hung out over the water. 
Well, when I was a little kid, I wanted to go fishing, so, so Dad would call my granddad about Wednesday. Now, I'm a kid. I don't know about all this background work. He'd call my granddad about Wednesday, and he'd say, I'm going to bring Tim up there fishing this weekend. Cut on the light. Do you know what the neat thing about, about fish is? They're drawn to what they want to eat. And that old light drew in the bugs that the fish like to eat. So my granddaddy would turn on that light about Wednesday, and then by the time Dad brought me up there Friday, those fish were just right there. Right there where that light was. So I had me a couple dozen minnows, and, and, and I just put one on the hook, and I'd drop it in there, and whoop, there you go, and I'd catch a fish. That's all there was to it. That's all there was to it. I thought fishing is so easy. All you got to do is go where there's a light, drop a minnow in there, and find somewhere to put all the fish. That's all there is to it. It's so easy. Do you know what? Later on, my granddad sold that place and I got a little bit older and I wanted to go fishing again. And I thought it would be just as easy. Do you know, I found out a lot different. I found out a lot different. Fishing ain't quite so easy. My dad had set me up for success. <laughs> and, and it was great. But I realized... I don't know how to fish. I don't know how to find them rascals. I don't know how to figure out where they're at because where Dad took me, they were just there. There's a there's other little story there. You know, like I followed my dad to where the fish were. If we'll follow our Heavenly Father, He'll always put us where the fish are. He's got you where He wants to use you. We'll say grow where God planted you. Hello? He means that. I'll tell you something I learned. You gotta have all kinds of things in place to find fish. If you want to be a fisherman, ask Gene Shaw, he's a pretty good fisherman right here. He hadn't took me yet, so I can't confirm it. In <laughs> here. But you know, we got all these things to find fish with. We got radar, we got sonar, we look at the weather patterns, we know the barometric pressure, we know the, what time of the year it is and the water depth and where the fish going to be at, what they bite and what they don't bite, and what, when they will bite, make them keep from spitting it out. We got expensive rods and reels and, and fishing line that's just engineered for catching fish and being low visibility in the water. We got all these things to catch fish. But you're never going to catch a fish in your backyard. You got to go where the fish are. You got to find the fish. And sometimes it'll be as easy as when I was a kid. Just go right there and drop that hook in where the light's at. Sometimes, sometimes you're going to have to be committed. We're going to have to be prepared. We're going to have to be ready to go out and find the fish. You see, a good fisherman learns all about the fish. The good fisherman don't go out in his boat and say, Hey, fish! I'm such a good fisherman, I'm going to need all y'all to jump in my boat. And then stand there and wait for them to come in. How many fish do you think you'll catch that way? I'm going to say not a lot. Even old Bill Dance wasn't that good. The good fisherman learns all about the fish. I bet Gene can tell us stuff about fish we don't even want to know. Because he's a good fisherman. we got to learn what the fish like. <clears throat> this hurts a little bit. But church can't always be about what I like and what you like if we're going to get fish to come here. And if we ain't going to go out to where the fish are, we better have us a lot here that will draw them into where we are. we got to do one of the two. we either got to draw them into here or we got to go out and get them and bring them here. That's our two options. 
we're in the following business. And we're in the finding business. But you know, I got, I got to tell you another little story about that finding business. I think most of us like to go around in our lake. That's wherever it is you go every day. And I think we like to cruise the lake in our boat. And I think we like to enter to you. And I think we like to water ski. And yet we want to call ourselves fishermen. We want to call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ. But we'll go around day after day through our routine. We run into people, maybe two, maybe a thousand you run into every day. And we go through there and we don't ever think about asking them if they're saved. We don't ever think about it if they're on their way to heaven or on their way to hell. And we just ride our inner tube. We ski behind the boat. We go boat riding. And we call ourselves fishermen. Let's folks get back to it. That's what Jesus called us to be. Now if I'm going to call myself a follower of Jesus, He says, I'll make you fishers of men. So if He said follow me and I followed Him, if that has happened... He's going to make me a fisher of men. Let me tell you what. After I got grown and I had a boat, I had my own boat, and I, I loved fishing, and I had my boat, and I had all this fishing gear, and I had all these different kind of worms, and bait, and spinner baits, and all kinds of things like that. And, and, and I, had, I had the depth finder, and the radar, and all that stuff, and and I went out and I was really trying to learn how to find those fish. I stand here before you today and I tell you, I don't own a boat anymore. If you went and found my tackle box, probably the plastic worms and stuff melted in there. <laughs> I don't even know if my hooks are probably rusty. I've got some fishing rods and they're in that building down there, I think. But how am I going to stand here and tell you I'm a fisherman? That happened in my life. I got saved and I got excited about Jesus. And I was telling everybody about Him. But at some point along the way, I quit looking for fish. Because it didn't matter to me. I put my rods and reels in the building. I sold my boat. Can't find my tackle box anymore. I quit going and hanging out with other fishermen. Let me say this. If we don't care about people dying and going to hell, we're not right with God. Yet I'd like to tell everybody I was still a fisherman. Using a metaphor here, this is my life. I got saved, I got in church, I got excited, I tell everybody about Jesus, and then next thing I know, I'm out of church. I'm not telling anybody about Jesus. I'm offended when they come ask me if I'm saved. I shouldn't have been offended. I should have went and looked in a mirror. <coughs> ask me if I'm saved. I've been in church. I, I got saved in 1989. I'm taking you right to where I got saved. And then one old guy had the gall to ask me, how do you know you're saved? Man, get out of here. I got saved. I filled out a card. I'll tell you this. I didn't care about people going to heaven or hell. Well, I might say I did. If I sat down and thought about it, I might have. But I didn't care enough about asking them if they were saved. I didn't care enough to tell people about Jesus anymore. I'd lost my zeal to fish. <coughs> Do you know what? I got down at an old-fashioned altar a few years ago. And I got right with God. And I tell you, I can't wait to catch some more fish. 
I just can't wait to catch some more fish. Every day I wake up, God is my witness. Every day I wake up and think, how can we catch some more fish today? Now I might get busy and I might get sidetracked and I may not do it. I'm going to be honest with you. Some days I, I use the wrong bait. Some days I look outside and the weather's not any good and I just don't want to go get in that boat. Some days I do all the right things. Some days I'm right where I'm supposed to be. The weather's just like it's supposed to be. The, the barometric pressure, I'm right at the water depth. I've got the right bait. I've got the right fishing pole. I've got the right attitude. I'm there at the right time of day. And fish just don't bite. That ever happened, Gene? You ever in the right place at the right time using the right thing you know you are and you, you, fish just won't bite? That's not on me. That's where God takes over. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. But we've got to remember we're in the finding business. We're not going to catch any fish unless we find them. Third, we are in the fishing business. We're in the following business, we're in the finding business, and we're in the fishing business. Look at verse 19 again. When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat mending their nets. And Jesus had told these first disciples, He said, you're fishing for fish now, but I'm going to make you fishers of men. I think it's so neat that he called fishermen to be his first disciples and he told them, you're going to fish all right. <laughs> you ain't going to fish with those critters swimming in the water. I'm going to make you fishers of men. In other words, what they were doing for a living wasn't what Jesus wanted them to do with their life. What you do for a living may not be what Jesus wants you to do with your life. Amen? Amen? <clears throat> I think back to that that fishing, the deep sea fishing trip I went on. And we was catching those fish and it was so neat, y'all. It was so cool because we're fishing there and you know, we're reeling the fish in and it's, and it's neat. And, well, I feel my old fishing rod just pull real hard. And I snatched back on it and oh, I'd hook something good. I thought I'd probably hook Jaws. That's what I think's happened. This old fishing rod, the great big round thing's just been over like this. The deck hand's coming over there, getting everybody out of the way. I thought, oh, we hooked this one here. This is going to be so much fun. I can't wait to get back. It's going to cost me $4,000 to get this mounted, whatever it is I'm fixing to drag up here, because it's going to be something. It's exciting. The, the guys working on the boat, they come over there. That thing's bent over. I'm just like this. I'm leaning back all I can do. That old fish is pulling with all it's got. And I think, mean, this is good. <coughs> and I reel and I fight and I reel and I fight. And these guys are telling me, well, let the line out, do this, do that. Ooh, I can't wait to get this thing in the boat. They just don't let the line break. And I got it up to the side of the boat and they took, a, they took a hook and they hooked it and they drug it up on the boat. And I saw the deck hands start to walk off and they're not excited anymore. And the one reaches down there and he unhooks it and he just kicks the old fish off back in the water. I think it was about that big. I never caught anything like that in the Coosa River. I looked at him and I said, what would you do that for? He said, that was a bonita. I was going to put that in my living room wall. I said, it's a trash fish. I said, a what? I said, it's a trash fish. That fish ain't no good for nothing. Oh, I got to thinking about that. I got to thinking about that. And it made me realize, you know what? There ain't no trash fish in God's ocean. God don't make any junk. We look at people and we see drug addicts. 
We see thieves. We see adulterers. We see people that have embezzled money. We see life. We see trash fish. But you know what? Jesus Christ died for that same soul just like He did for yours. How dare us as a church and as Christians look down on people and think they're not good enough to be in our church. The ocean that God's got for us to fish in. There ain't no such thing as a trash fish. I'm going to tell you what. Every one of them people, every person out there that we've got a chance to reach in the name of Jesus Christ is a trophy. They're important. They mean something. They mean enough for Jesus Christ to shed His blood and die for them. There's no trash fish in Jesus' water. They're all important. And if we're going to be in the fishing business, we got to realize God didn't call any of us to be His advisors. He called us to fish, but He didn't call any of you, and He didn't call me. God didn't call any of us to be His advisor. I like to say, Lord, you know they ain't never going to come to church. You know oh, so-and-so is never going to get right. How dare us do that? How dare us do that? See, God didn't call me to be His advisor. He just called me to fish. Look at verse 19 one more time. When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, mending their nets. See, these guys were fishing for a living. They were taking big nets and they were bringing them around through the water and then they would drag them in they'd drag all the fish in they could in a big net. So why were these two guys mending the nets? Well, it's pretty obvious there was a hole in the net. What does a hole in your fishing net mean? It means you're not going to catch any fish. Some of you hanging your heads. I'll tell you when it's time to pray because you figured out where this is going. I pray that every day, every one of us will be on our knees asking, Lord, am I the hole in your net today? Am I the reason our neighbors aren't coming to Christ? Am I the reason that co-worker of mine doesn't know you? These guys are mending their nets. Lord, please don't let me be the hole in your net. Please don't let me be the distraction in church to keep somebody from making a decision for you. Lord, please don't let me be a hole in your net. The only way we're going to know if we're the hole in the net is to be right with Him. Be right with Him. You know what? Let me tell you some, some classic holes in the church's net. We're in a boat. We're fishing for men. We can get some holes in our net. And when we get a hole in our net, we're not going to catch any fish. Let me tell you four classic holes in the net. First, it's more about keeping who you have than catching who you don't. Let me say this. I love all... You're my church family. And I mean that. The more you're around me, the more you know I mean that. I love you. If you're here today and you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, your personal Lord and Savior, I'm going to get to see you for all eternity. You're going to see my ugly mug for all eternity. I care about you. I love you. I love being around you. I love our church family. There ain't 10 or 30 others I'd trade for you. I wouldn't trade you for any church family. But you know what? When we get so focused on us, and we don't focus on people dying and going to hell, we're not right with God. We're not right with Jesus. When it becomes more about 
us keeping us here than it is about winning them out there to Jesus Christ, we got some changes to make. First thing, when it, it's more about keeping who you have than catching who you don't. Second, leading people to Jesus becomes secondary. I've been to some churches that, that didn't win anybody to the Lord, but boy, they never had a mistake on Sunday morning. Their sound equipment never messed up. They didn't ever have somebody play the wrong song back there in the back. Carry me down. <laughs> I love to pick on Kerry because he was, you know, he was telling me about, you know, the sound was doing something funny when they were practicing this morning. He said, oh, it's, it was driving this one and that one and this one was turned too far. I said, come on, bro. I don't have a clue what you're talking about. I couldn't even press play back there. That's why it's fun to pick on. I've been in churches that, that never had, preacher was always dressed impeccably. Everybody's hair was did just right. They had preacher had preacher hair. I don't have preacher hair. I don't have good preacher hair. Good preacher hair is never sticking out the back. It's never doing nothing like that. I don't have it. They had everything what they thought was perfect. They had it perfect for what they wanted, and they never want anybody to Jesus Christ. Never had any new guests come to their church. And I wonder, has leading people to Jesus become secondary to the production of putting on a church service? Hope that never happens here. I hope when the wrong track gets played or the wrong... We don't want that stuff to happen. Amen? It's important to us. We put a lot of time and effort into having a church service. Everything being just right. But when it's not, I hope we can laugh about it and move on. Because I hope leading people to Jesus is, is more important than something putting on a show. But when it's more about keeping who you have than catching who you don't, and when it's more about leading people, when leading people to Jesus becomes secondary, you've got a hole in your net. The third thing is, we have an attitude that it's easier just to stay where we are. Goodness gracious. Some of y'all know that we did the personality profiles that, that, that part of my personality is an S personality. I don't get into what all that means, but part of what that means is, is I like status quo. I like things to be consistent. I like things to be the same. I like to know when I come in here that, you know, where my coffee pot's at, where the coffee's kept back there in the kitchen. I like to know Michael's going to be here a little bit before nine. I like to know where the light switches are at. I like to know everything's going on. You know what I don't like about preaching in another church? You know I preached at Edgewood last Sunday night. Some of y'all were with me. I appreciate that. I had a good time. You know what was one of my primary worries before I went up on that stage? If I had the microphone right where they could hear me. You know why? Because it's a little different than this one. I like status quo. I like things to stay the same. Do you know what? We can like things to stay the same so much we can get so comfortable with where we're at that we don't ever think about reaching anybody for Jesus. We don't think about growing. We say we do, but we don't think about it because truth be known, we're happy to stay right where we are. Because you know what? When we go from 50 to 60 and from 60 to 100, from 100 to 200, you know what that's going to mean? That's going to mean not, not everything ain't going to go smoother. There's going to be more problems. There's going to be more people here hurt and needing resources from the church. That's going to mean the church resources get spread thinner. There's going to be more ministries for us to get involved in and, and work out. It's not going to get easier. Sometimes we say, hey, whoa, whoa. we're afraid it's going to grow bigger than what we can control. And I hope it does. I hope it just gets so out of control I just have to call the board together and say, I don't have a clue what we're going to do with all these people. Goodness gracious. We're going to have to tear walls out. We're going to set the floor or something. 
I hope that happens. But my heart's got to be in that for it to happen. And your heart's got to be in it for it to happen. The fourth thing, we no longer care enough to prepare. Big hole in our net. It was obvious <laughs> these ladies up here this morning and Carrie that they, they didn't just walk in and say, hey, let's sing that song today. It's pretty obvious Miss Donna's She's played this once or twice. She prepared to play the music this morning. They prepared to lead us in worship today. I prepared the sermon for you today. We prepared the slides. Somebody had enough foresight to say, hey, we need to pay the power company or we're not going to have any lights on. we got to pay the water bill. We gotta pay the insurance. When you don't care enough to prepare to catch fish, the fish know it. The fish know it. They know when you're faking it. They know when you're not prepared. And they know when you don't care. They know when you don't care. Sometimes it's the little things. We don't have visitors anymore. We have guests. Look at our guest information card now. We changed that. It's a small, little bitty thing. You know what? The word visitor means unexpected guest. So whether we even realize it or not, when we say, feel like we're glad you're visiting with us today, will you fill out this visitor card? We're so glad we have visitors today. We're actually saying, we didn't expect you. Folks, it's pretty rare to catch a fish when you didn't expect to catch one. It's pretty rare to catch a fish when you didn't care enough to prepare to go fishing. I know, I know a lot of folks have been fishing a lot more times than I have. But I don't ever remember the fish jumping out of the water into my boat. I had to make sure I had gas in the boat. I had to make sure I had enough fuel in my truck to get the boat to the water. I had to make sure I prepared enough to bring a fishing rod. I had to make sure I prepared enough to bring bait. I had to prepare. And when new guests come, and they know we didn't prepare, they know it. And what it says is, you didn't care. I care enough to hug you out. I better not be the only one. Amen? Amen. Biggest hole we can have our internet is we don't care enough to prepare. We need to be prepared to go out and catch fish. We need to be willing to get on our knees and say, Lord, lead me to the fish. Lord, tell me everything to say. Lord, tell me every thought to have. Lord, tell me just exactly what to say. Lord, tell me exactly when to keep my mouth shut and let them talk. Lord, tell me what you want me to do to catch fish. Folks, as Miss Donna comes, I want you to know if we're not in the fishing business as a church, we're out of business. I'm not talking about monetary there or the door shut or anything like that. If we're not going to be about the business of catching fish, if we're not going to be about the business of leading people to Christ, if we're not going to be about that business, the Lord will take His hand and provision off of us the Lord will take His hand of favor off of us and He'll put it on somebody else. Let's all stand together.